midshipmen, I ask that you raise your right hand and at the conclusion of the oath, your response is, I do. I, having been appointed a midshipman in the United States Navy, do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I have entered. So help me God. Aye. Aye. Brigade Midshipmen, seats. one of us started our naval careers by taking that oath of office. I felt it was so important that we listen to those words and that we reaffirm who we are. Those words define who we are. They're rooted in history. Those words are developed by our very first commander-in-chief, our first president, General George Washington. They've evolved over the 225 years of the oath. They changed during the Civil War or World Wars. And on October 5th, 1962, all of the words of the officer and enlisted oath were put into law by Congress. They bring us together to remind us that we are members of the profession of arms. They ensure that we respect our history but that we're bound together today. And it also reminds us that all of us volunteer because we believe that we are joining something bigger than ourselves. Welcome back, Brigade. For the class of 2015, congratulations on a phenomenal Cleve Summer Training event. You're to be congratulated for everything that you've done. For the class of 2018, Although you have not officially joined the brigade, congratulations on what you have done in transforming from civilian life to military life in just about seven weeks. So congratulations to both our seniors and our plebes. Yeah, you can clap. It's good. sitting here as a, a, a plebe on July 7th, 1977. I've served 33 years in the Navy, and I've been at sea most of my adult life. I've had the privilege of commanding squadrons, ships, aircraft carrier, carrier strike group, and the job I did before here, I was the president of the U.S. Naval War College. I've been in command for the last 19 years of my life. I've operated from the shipyard in complex operations, training operations. I've had the privilege of leading frontline combat troops. And I've come to know a few things over the years. And I want to share with you some of those guiding principles that I think will serve you well. These ideas will not only do well for you here while you're at the Naval Academy, They'll work for you in the fleet, and they'll work for you in civilian life. Some of these you've heard in other ways, but and as simple as they are, if you put them together collectively, you'll find that these will make you successful in anything you try to do in life. So the first guiding principle is the truth. Now, it's wonderful to be back in an institution where we have this thing called the honor concept. But the truth is more complicated, and of course, there is no honor concept when you 
get through graduation and commission as an ensign or second lieutenant. The truth is about building the foundation for trust. And it's more than just being able to answer questions truthfully. It's about empowering the entire chain of command so that our most junior sailor or marine feels empowered to tell the most senior officer in their chain of command that something's not right. And we as leaders must understand that whether we're taking information that's good, bad, or ugly, that we never shoot the messenger. That information never gets better with age. And for all of us that are joining a world where our machinery, our, our gear is very complicated, and because we're in a, an operation that involves the human endeavor where we are by nature imperfect, things will happen. So that makes each and every one of us problem solvers. So when bad things do happen, we must be able to take that information correct it, learn from it, and move on. Without trust, we're nothing. And you don't have to look very far in the headlines today. In Ferguson, Missouri, in terms of civilian authority, that's lost the trust of its people. None of us can do our business without it. It's number one for that reason. Number two is loyalty. And loyalty can be broken down into three simple parts. Loyalty to yourself is the most important. Now, you're here at an institution where we pretty much schedule your day almost 24 hours a day. For our plebes, they probably feel like they've had absolutely no freedom to do anything. But the truth is, you have quite a bit of freedom. You have to be loyal to yourself, number one. If you can't take care of yourself, number one, nobody else can. And I'm talking about loyalty to yourself in terms of what you do with and for your body. The calories you take in, the type of food that you eat, your understanding of what the rules are on drugs and alcohol, and to be inspired by what you're getting here and the greatest education that you will ever get, and to continue on with that inspiration so that you will continue to seek education. These are all just some examples of being able to take care of yourself. And then there's loyalty to each other your classmates, your shipmates. We all must have the highest levels of dignity and respect for each other, regardless of the color of our skin, our religious preference, our gender, our sexual preference, where we come from, what state, what country, our economic background. And it doesn't matter whether we're an admiral, or a seaman, or a young marine, that dignity and respect must go across the chain of command to include those in government service and contractors. And then we must have loyalty to our institution. We are all so fortunate to be here at the U.S. Naval Academy. It's a historic place. The buildings that we go through, where we get educated, where you live, most of them are over 100 years old in our historical sites. But maybe more importantly than how we take care of the structures and the physical things that we own, is we must be loyal to the ideals of an institution. Literally tens of thousands of alumni have come before us, 169 years worth of graduates here at the U.S. Naval Academy. The American public pays for our institution, they pay for your education. We must respect this institution and be loyal to it now and for the rest of your lives. And finally, we should have an expectation to do everything that we endeavor to do on time, successfully, first time. Now that may sound like a pretty easy statement. Again, we write pretty strict schedules. Tonight we started at 1900. But think about what it took to bring 4,500 of you just here to Alumni Hall. The planning, the execution, when you got here, when you got ready to get in here, it requires that level of reverse engineering to just do that simple thing successfully. 
When you move on from this institution, you will find that to be able to win in combat requires for you to have an understanding of what it takes to execute on time. And don't accept that it, you get a duel. Now, as you go through this institution, you'll find that everything we do here is about choices. It's been said that hardship and adversity determines your character. That may be partially true. But I believe that the choices you make before you see adversity and hardship will determine your character. You live that every day here with things that may not seem all that vitally important to you. In my experience, I've had to learn that what I got here, what I got from the senior officers who taught me as a young aviator in an F-4 fighter squadron shaped me so when that critical moment happened, that life-changing moment, I knew what to do. So I want to share with you just a short sea story to make the point. The year was 1999. I was a 39-year-old commander of an F-14 squadron. I was uh, assigned to VF-14, the top hatters on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And we had made our way across the Atlantic to participate in Operation Allied Force, which was combat operations against the Serb militia led by President Milosevic in the country of Kosovo. We had started our operations in early April, and on this particular day was 11 April 1999. That's a Sunday. And I was the strike lead of a 25-plane event, four Tomcats with bombs under the belly, four F-18s, all carrying 2,000-pound bombs. And it was significant for two reasons. It was significant first and foremost because it was the first mission that we flew in the daytime. Everything we had done up to that prior had been at night. But it was also significant to me because in my pre-flight planning and briefing, I realized that this particular day was Easter Orthodox Sunday. And in Serbia, a great portion of the population are Serb Orthodox Christians. So as a strike lead, obviously I asked all those questions. Is this appropriate that we go in and take out a pretty big target? It was a, it was a bridge. It was the first time we were going to take out a bridge. The Serb militia had been moving tanks to ethnically cleanse the Albanians who were living in the southern provinces of Kosovo. And I was assured that that had been thought through, and we had made a determination that this was a legal and proper target. We would save many lives if we could drop this bridge. So think about a bridge about the size of the new Severn River Bridge, maybe a little bit bigger. So as the mission went on, we launched. We had everybody up in the air. Our time in Kosovo was actually quite short. We're moving at altitude at 600 miles an hour. And as we swung north of the target by only 10 miles, moving from north to south on what you would probably think of as government time, heads down, I in the back seat as a strike lead, and my F-14 Tomcat had my cursors clearly picked up on one of the, the, the foots of the bridge. From 10 miles away, with literally only about a minute to go, I could see that there was no movement on the bridge, and I was relieved. And of course, we're making this mission with no communication, we're in a line of breast formation. Eight strike fighters all across. At seven miles, the resolution of my camera on the infrared screen was good enough for me to see that there was no movement on the bridge because it was in a full traffic jam. I couldn't tell you how many cars there were on there. I could just see that it was stacked. With about six seconds to release, I instinctively stepped on the microphone and called for the abort. Thanks to the discipline of my seven wingmen, nobody dropped a weapon. We returned back to the carrier and landed with our weapons intact. There was a lot of pressure to take that bridge out, and I was questioned about it. 
And I had a videotape to prove that there was a good reason for not killing a lot of innocent people on that bridge. And I was still questioning about it. And as fate would have it, on the very next day, April 12, 1999, an Air Force F-15E e Strike Eagle made a similar strike on a train trestle bridge called the Bradelica Bridge. This F-15E launched an AGM-130, which is a jet-propelled 500-pound bomb missile. And as that missile went into the train trestle, a train just happened to cross right over the bridge. It killed 16 people, men and women, pregnant women, critically injured 12 others. It changed the whole face of the war. Now that event for me was my defining moment out of all the things that I've ever done in my career. I don't wear a ribbon or a medal. I'm very thankful that I didn't get a court-martial over that. You don't know when your defining moment will come. Now, we did this oath of office just a few minutes ago. And for most of us, when you go down to King Hall, you'll notice that that oath of office is up in bronze, right there in Brancroft Hall. And on the opposite side is a mission statement of the United States Naval Academy. And most of us are aware of the beginning of that, to prepare midshipmen mentally, morally, and physical, physically, to imbue the highest levels of duty, honor, and loyalty. And we're doing that, and we're going to continue to do that. But it's the end of the mission statement that I think sets us apart from everybody else. To develop mind and character, to assume the highest levels of responsibility in command, citizenship, and government. That's a pretty spectacular list of things that we want you to do. We're not just talking about what will make you the best leaders in the United States Navy and the Marine Corps. We're talking about making you the future leaders of our nation. And what will the future look like for you? A lot of people think that we're going to go into this wonderful time of peace. We've moved the ground troops out of Iraq a number of years ago. In two years, we'll be moving most of our ground troops out of Afghanistan. I want to let you in on a little secret here. If you were to take a full look at history, 3,400 years of recorded human civilization, 268 years of those 3,400 years, the world was at some sort of peace. Public math, that's about 7% of recorded human history. So let's look at more modern history. The United States, since 7 December 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Our United States armed forces have not been in conflict somewhere around the world for seven years total. That's roughly about 10%. So you're going to see conflict during your time, whether you serve for five years, 10 years, 30 years, or 40 years. That you should be certain of. But the face of conflict in the future will be different. And you will be on the cutting edge of understanding what has been previously thought of its own unique domain called cyber. And the truth is cyber will be in every domain that we operate in. Air, land, sea, above, below, space. And then this merging with this other aspect of warfare called the electromagnetic spectrum. In five to ten years, you will be the ones that determine how we will master those two domains and how we will win our future conflicts from the sea. Because the Earth isn't changing. It's still surrounded by 70% water. And 90% of everything that moves in trade comes by the water. Those are going to be constants. And we're going to need a powerful Navy and Marine Corps. And you're going to be the leaders of it. Now, I've given you a lot to think about tonight. We've talked about the oath. I talked about some guiding principles centered around truth, loyalty, and executing on time. We talked about, a little bit about the future. It can be kind of confusing. I'd like to offer you two words that we, all of us, 
can keep in our back pocket, that we can use to remind ourselves and even communicate with each other. Two simple words, strength and virtue. Those two words encapsulate everything I've talked about. Strength. Strength of body to achieve whatever physical mission you need to do, whether it be to max out your PT test, win in Division I athletics, or win your intramural company sports program. Strength of mind to have the fortitude to do the right thing always when no one's looking, even when there doesn't appear to be consequence. And the strength to be a better teammate. We talk about the, the strength and the links of the chain. We often focus on what we think might be the weakest link in the chain. We should focus on improving all of the chain so that we improve the overall strength of the chain. When you graduate from this institution, you will be in charge of the greatest enlisted non-commissioned force the world has ever known. Many of you will be given charge of 50, 60 talented men and women. And their oath of office is a little bit unique to the one that we just did. They swear to obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over them according to regulations in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. They're very proud of that. And you should know and respect what that means. So the next time you take the oath, whether it be for your own commissioning or for a reenlistment when you go into the fleet, you should have the strength and understanding to have the words memorized, just as I did for you tonight and for the rest of your career. Now, virtue. Virtue is a phenomenal word. It has meaning in the past and meaning in today. In classical times, virtue had the four parts called cardinal virtues. Courage, temperance, justice, wisdom. Those are the foundations of character development. In the modern times, Webster's Dictionary today defines virtue as moral excellence. To give it a nautical analogy, virtue is it's the moral compass by which we can all navigate in whatever sea state we're sailing. So strength and virtue, those are the words during my time that I will remind each and every one of us whenever I can. In Latin, fortis et virtus, strength and virtue. I want to thank you all for your attention tonight. Congratulations on the reformation of the brigade. I look forward to being your superintendent. I'm very anxious to see how you can develop to not only be the future leaders of our Navy and Marine Corps, but of our nation, and become the next greatest generation of American leaders. God bless the Brigade of Midshipmen. God bless all who are standing to watch around the world tonight to protect and defend our freedom. Strength and virtue, Brigade. Good night.